pretty much like a small mini Hong Kong. Uh, the people living here are from different cultural backgrounds and they squeeze in a limited space. This is the shop. This is the grocery stores where I buy the music for Chungking Express, the Indian music. It's not very expensive. It's cost only $20 Hong Kong. This is the place where we shoot the uh, shooting scene in Chungking uh, Express with Bridget Lin shooting uh, two Indians. This is the place in which you work. We have the paintings of Edward Hopper and I said I want the film to be something like a monochrome and uh, there's a lot of green in the film. We, we actually see very monochrome in, 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 uh, for, uh, because he's always wearing his sunglasses. I mean, you know, it has a, you know, things seem to kind of dilute you know, the colors of it. Also I because I made some mistakes in the printing. So. <laughs> he put three filters in front of the lenses, so it's always uh, a problem in focus. We may have made a mistake, <laughs> but we stuck with it. And, and there was enough support from him and from some of the people on the film that we, we had to preserve, you know, we had to go with it. On the first day of shootings, we work in a very small tea house. The only way we can do is uh, to shoot with a wide-angle lens. But I think uh, we should uh, do something more interesting. So I asked Chris to wear an extremely wide-angle lens. He said, yes. But in that case, the face of uh, Michelle is, uh, she looks like a banana. There is about space. We use a wide angle because these people are so close together but so distant, you know, uh, you know, and the camera should be close to them, therefore you feel very close to them, but you know that they're really separated by a great distance of, you know, incomprehensibility, you know, they can't talk to each other. That's after the fact. I mean, the real fact is, it was a small space and we had to get close, right? And then you start going in that direction and you say, hey, it's working, this is interesting. And then you try and put on another lens and you say, shit, you know, I mean, anything else doesn't work. When you shoot a gun, you know, at the camera, the cameraman, if it's me, he usually goes, oh! <laughs> so I think this is partly how the handhold style that we've developed together started. You know? This distorted you know, way in which things, you know, move in and out of your, your perception, the way, you know, things are blurred, time is blurred, the way things sort of jump, you know, and suddenly you're in a different space and, you're, and you realize it. It's how you perceive violence. He won't admit it. But I hope it's poetic. I hope it's about poetry. I hope it's about the poetry of life. I hope it's about the poetry of love, the poetry of, of the impossibility of, you know, various things, that, you know, and, 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 and the, the consequences of, 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 of certain choices. I'm sure a lot of it, and of course time. There's so much of this stuff is about time, and obviously, you know, you play with the time in which the film passes through the camera. I mean, this seems to be a logical step, you know, to me. Ms. Pa? Talk like a film critic. Yes, I, yes, I've been, I've been reading, I've been reading Tony Rains all week. <laughs> Your films, people say, are about romance and relationships, and that you are fascinated by character, not story. Well, for me, it's always come from the characters first, because stories is more or less to me is all, always more or less the same, same thing, but like a love story, you can tell it in a different way. Like for me, in The Mood for Love, it's, it's a love story, because it involves two persons. And in The Mood for Love, it's, it's a story about love, because it's about one person. And it is the, like uh, uh, the aftertaste of love. Here's what you said, too, on filmmaking. Making movies is like loving a very dangerous woman. You have to serve her, Make her happy and care for her, or she'll leave you. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you don't pay attention to your movie, it won't be what you want it to be. Yes, It'll be and, something and, else. And also, you less. have to you have to wait for her. Wait for her. Yes, because like uh, people ask me, why why you need uh, five years to make this film? Yeah. Because, but 
there's so many reasons because uh, we produce the film uh, 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 by ourselves. And during these five years, a lot of things happened. SARS, for one. Yes. So we have to, to, to stop the productions and then we have to wait for all these actors and actresses. So if a film is like a woman, then to make it simple, it's you're attracted by this film, you're attracted by this woman, and you have to wait for her. What, what do you think your most distinguishing quality is as a filmmaker? Patience. Patience? Right. You're willing to wait four or five years to make this movie? No, it's, it's not only about uh, that. It's, it, you have to, to, to wait for the right moment uh, for the film or for a shot or for emotions and also for very uh, practical reasons you have to wait for the locations. There's a lot of things. And, and, and I, think f I think for directors it's very important that you have patience. Patience beyond for all the factors to come together, the convergence of the actors and the venue and everything else, but also patience in terms of waiting for the right performance? I mean. Wow. No, it's like like I, I just uh, told you. It's like um, like you are very attracted to 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 a person, to a woman, and you want to to date her. So you will wait <laughs> under her balcony, see, right? See, I told you everything for you is in your relationship to women, right? Everything. That's how you characterize everything. No, it's not true. It's not true. But <laughs> I think true. we have to do it this way now. <laughs> because at the very beginning, we both agreed that we want to make something interesting. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, right. the most pervasive influence on you was your mother. It's true. True. Yes. Even as a filmmaker. Because uh, when we came to this city, to Hong Kong, we don't have any relatives here. And we don't speak any, any Cantonese. So my mother like uh, films a lot. And we live in a, uh, an area which uh, has a lot of cinemas. So we almost spend every day in a, c a, c a cinema set. Is that right? Afternoon, right? So we have, we have the chance to see all these uh, American films, European films, and, and, and local productions. Is that where the dream began? Yes. It is, it's like Graham Greene said. It's like... Uh, Graham uh, Greene? Yes, it's the, the, your, your, your darkness in the afternoon. <laughs> And it's wonderful. Now, did she get to see you successful as a filmmaker? No. She passed away before I become the director. And it is one of my biggest regrets. I bet it is. Yes. To have her see a movie you made after yes. all those hours of sitting there in the theater. Because she's the one who introduced me to, to cinemas and also music. She's a very good singer. She's a good singer. Yes. Um, Yang Ho Ping, who is the legendary like, uh, uh, um, action choreographer, and he, he is actually 70 years old, and he's, he went through all this period. And so he understands the intention. So the first thing, I think, in our first meeting, I said, well, uh, um, I, call her, uh, I call him Ba Ye, because that means his uncle, he's uh, uh, a senior. So I said, well, I want this film to be different. He said, yes, every director, when we work together, he said, I want something different. <laughs> so how different do you want? I said, OK. The, uh, uh, I want this film to be done like in the most authentic way, as authentic as possible. I want to see all the move is very authentic to the school. If he's, play, if he's a Wing Chun master, he has to do Wing Chun thing. So it's not going to be, there's no wire, there's no flying. So, and, and he looked at me and said, are you serious? <laughs> I said, yes. And he said, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I bring him to this training camp to look at uh, Tommy Le and Zhang Ji because I trained them with actual trainer for two years. So when, when he looked at Tony and Ji, he said, well, okay, I know you're, you're serious now. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a very hard uh, process to do the action for this film. And in fact, when we are doing, uh, um, doing all choreographies um, sequence, I always look at your sequence at Raging Bull with my DP because I think that's the, one of the best action scenes made uh, in the history of cinema. And so it, there's no tricks besides of special makeups, blood. Basically, it's a cinematic tour. It's a cinematic journey in which captures purely by like 
uh, camera and movement and action. So it's I, I just want to 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 show Gyeongbu Ping is like well this is something that we are looking for. We are not looking for something just for excitement. You have to feel the pain and and the substance of it. Whoa, um, that's an extraordinary extraordinary achievement. It really is. I always say about uh, Wong Kar Wai's films, it's like there's something that only can be a film, you know, the essence of cinema. And this is his work. It really is. But I know, I don't know, like for the scenes in, in, in Raging Bull, how, the, the fight scene in the rain, how long does it take? Oh, uh, yeah. It, uh, we had planned uh, four weeks, it took ten weeks. And then we did the scene where he gets beaten by Sugar Ray. That was. Uh, Maybe two setups a day. Right. Yeah. The same. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very time consuming when you're doing action. Yeah. Okay. That that sort of action, and very often we had to use slow motion because we couldn't see. Right. The fist going by. Right. Uh, we, we couldn't see the, the it, it went too quick. Yes. So they said, "Oh, he's using slow motion." I said, "At least we can see it. You know, we can see the action. What's going on? You know." And and my my problem is different because I can see that means they are not very fast because it's they have so many code on, so sometimes we use slow motion because now it seems like well it's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> in terms of the in terms of um, the production is three years. What about the editing process because of the way you cut your films? I find just to ask you how you do it or not how you do it but how do you what's the it takes, uh, what's the length of time it took? How you work? Do you work every day at it? Do you work with the editor? Um, yeah, because I, I, th I think it, my process is more or less like yours, because you work with Thelma. With Thelma, yeah. Right. Yes, to who's, who's I consider like the, one of the best editors yeah, in, in our generation. And so and I work with uh, William, yes. my production designer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, basically, we, we, we shoot the scenes and then uh, he cut at the same time. Ah. So, but the thing is, he, he always uh, do scene by scene. It's like uh, individual pieces. Yes. So I'm the one who at the end put all these things together and then we will do all this fine tune afterwards. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. Isn't it? But it, how, what was the length of time for the, for the editing on this? The actual time that we have to put this film together, I can give you like a, a clue, is we have the film, we need to release the film in China in, in January last year, and we're still shooting some like a cutaway close-up <laughs> before Christmas. Excellent, excellent. No, no, I've been in that position. Just been in there, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just did with Wolf of Wall Street. I delivered the film two days before. That was it. I think they wanted it on November 18th. I gave it to them on the 19th. I just couldn't do the 18th. I couldn't. <laughs> I'm not getting on the 18th, you know? Yes. We All just right, don't the 19th. Me. That's it. We just want to make sure. <laughs> I, I was told that you play music often when you shoot. Yeah. I heard it's uh, you. You did that also, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I learned it from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the most efficient way because sometimes without like very specific uh, uh, script, and and I think it's very important because I think make, making films most of the time, you uh, is something very key is about the rhythm, yeah. and I think the music on the set. It's a rhythm. Yes, yeah. give a sense of the rhythm, especially with for the camera, yes. for the blocking, and for the movement of the actors. I think that works very well. No, Thank I've you. used playback a lot. Uh, yes. For, for, for movement, camera movement. Camera movement, really. But the problem is I always fall in love with that music. Yeah, I know. That's the <laughs> well, the thing is you have to use the music you're going to use. Yes. We think. No. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> in other but, words... You know, I always try to get, get them the, uh, after we finish the film. And then... And then it's nightmare, you know. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, we started this kind of, years ago, we started it in a kind of naive way. It was just, uh, we were able to get um, uh, the music, let's say, in Mean Streets, and it cost a lot of money at that time, but nothing to what it is now. I think we were able to afford uh, five or six really key songs, and I did play back uh, the music, um, but we knew those were the songs, and they had, the producers started working on getting 
some sort of a deal, and, and they did it. That was 1973, though, and uh, within five or six years, that changed completely. Today is really hard because it's yes, become so expensive. Yeah, I found on Wolf of Wall Street that th there were a couple of cues that I had. It's almost a three-hour film. There's music from wall to wall, and uh, there were a couple of places that I happened to use by accident because we were shooting so fast. We were getting here, and it has an energy that's kind of crazy, and so there's a piece of music here, okay, put that on, and then we're doing, and so I had to use that music then in the editing, and then I got used to it, yes. but they were charging us $500,000 for us, no, I'm not going to do it, right. and so I had but to what are you going to do? So I had, that, in those cases, I found other pieces, other right. pieces that, that were, but you see, they weren't, they weren't pieces of music that um, I grew up with, or that I listened to, there were different types of music, and so it was really the, the uh, atmosphere. That I was going for. And it's, it's always like, uh, it's, it's killing us. It's, uh, because you fall in love with the music and you cut with its music, it's perfectly rhymed with its music. Oh. Because people said, well, how come your music works so well with your pictures? Because the film actually is born with them. So it's, it's very hard to take them out. I know, right. I know, I know. In fact, a couple of places, actually it was one 500,000, another 300,000, but eventually what happened was that they... Um, one of them we kept in, but there were a lot, a lot of negotiations. We had to screen the film for the people, etc., and they gave us a reduced fee. Still a lot of money, but I could not take the chance anymore. I couldn't recut the scene anymore. We were so late. Exactly. I had to deliver. <laughs> so we're trapped. Basically, the same situation. I'll pay anything. I said, I'll get, take it from my pocket. I'll do it. No problem. Just because it's, uh, for this film, actually, we have used like two Mario Corny tracks from uh, Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, in America. And because I played that on set. So it's very hard for me to, to, to replace it. And also, I think this is kind of a, a homage. Right. My salute to these two wonderful people, Sergio Leone and, and Morricone. But it's so expensive. So it's right before we, we do the final mix, I have to send people oh. to prac to record it. Oh. Oh. But uh, it's, it's, it's desperate, very desperate. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea of using... Uh, themes from other movies in with these. Yeah, I, d I never have a problem with that yeah. because it's yeah. it's it brings with not only the music but also the history of it. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, just big, I think we only have a uh, little time, but I just I wanted to ask a few questions from the audience. But yeah. one thing, could you talk about the writing process? Uh, uh, how detailed was the script or not? Well, and, and uh, actually, everybody said you, he, he don't work with the script. is is true, but uh, but somehow I'm writing every day. Yeah. So it basically, it's like um, I I don't I have a frame of the story, and I keep changing because I can see what the the the, the genesis of the characters. I can see like Tony's going this way, and Gong Ara actually is. Uh, going that way. I don't know your process, but my process is always I start from the character first. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah. And I also start from their physical presence. Mm -hmm. So if I have a guy there, I have to know like what's in his pocket yeah. and in his jacket. And and for like the character of Gomer, we know she's not she's a modern woman in a traditional Thai society. So the, her outfit basically is not paint, purely Chinese. He has some elements yeah, in it. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. So um, how did you sort of plot and uh, make your way into directing? Because the Hong Kong film industry was, wasn't known for personal films. It, the films were being cranked out, kind of generic films. And you, you started right, you know, you wrote for a number of years before you directed as tears go by. Actually, I was, I, I was uh, uh, studying uh, graphic design and um, in Hong Kong Polytechnics. And I don't know why, because actually I have no, no talents in drawing. <laughs> but I can take good pictures. So uh, say, they said, well, you, you, you come to be our students. And at that time, this is the, the beginning of like uh, the so-called Hong Kong New Wave, because it's, we, we went into like the televisions era. Uh, at that point, there's a lot of uh, uh, very important uh, directors, like Choi Ha, Patrick Thames, and, and um, An Hui. They, they study uh, uh, cinemas in, in, like, uh, in England or in the, uh, America, and they come back to Hong Kong to work in television uh, stations. And it become like a, a very trendy business. And it's almost like 
IT business in 10 years ago. It's like, wow, this is like Everybody all the kids it. want to do, do it. And so uh, uh, somehow they have a, a training uh, class for, uh, for like uh, to train writers and directors. It's not a film school because um, they pay you. And the only thing you have to do is to watch films and to, to be a, like a film student. I, th I think, well, that's very cool. So, so I quit um, being a, 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 a graphic design student and joined the television stations. And from there, I meet a lot, like uh, directors and writers. And one year later, a lot of people leave because um, that's, I think, the beginning of like the Hong Kong uh, uh, new wave. In, in, uh, the, in the film industry. So they need a lot of new um, like writers and, and uh, um, assistant directors. So I, I become a writer. And then I, I become a writer for like more than 10 years. When I become a director, I think, well, he's my model. I think I can do something like this. But I, I realize I'm not because I'm still, the night before shooting, I'm still working on the script because I keep changing it. And I said, well, I wake up in the morning and I, I have two hours, I can do all these uh, short lists. And then I wake up like half an hour before the shoot, so I, I go to, it's, it's total panic. And, and then, and then the, uh, because I learned some tricks before as, as a writer, because as a writer you have to be on set all the time in Hong Kong. I mean, it's, it's because you are the psychiatrist of a director. So you learn some tricks. And, and, and so I said, well, this shot is going to be very complicated. I want to see the action. So we are going to make a long track. It's almost as long as here. And so we just follow these two guys jumping around all these tables, so set up the shots. So they will have, because it is going to be a big setup, so it will take at least three hours so I can have time. <laughs> and, and I still remember like uh, the DP, uh, of uh, STS go by actually is Andrew Lau, who later on become a very successful director, um, who's the who made uh, uh, films like uh, Internal Affairs, and um, I still remember Andrew is at that point is very very young and very energetic, and we we are we are basically we are very like uh, primitive to shot this shot because normally people we have a lot. If you are following these actions with a dolly, people will have a lot of like cushions at the end because the camera will just vroom, hit the wall like this. But we don't have this kind of thing because I didn't tell them the night before. So actually we line up few other like stuntmen over there. So, <laughs> so the cameras go like this and then vroom. So they will run into all these stuntmen and start over again. But, but in those days, it's really fun. It's, it's because we are all very, very young, and we, we feel like, well, we're doing something very amazing. Because in those days, all these filmmakers are very close. Tomorrow, it will become like a legend. Everybody talking about, wow, they, they, they did a great shot, a very cool shot yesterday. And, and that's the, those the, were the days in, in Hong Kong that make films. It's, we are very close, and, and it's like um, a new communities, you know. The move to day, Days of Being Wild, which was the, uh, the title of the film, had the same, uh, was very close to the, the Cantonese title of Rebel Without a Cause, the Nick Ray film. Was that a, um, specific, I mean, was that film specifically in your mind when you were making it? In fact, I'm very lazy with titles. Just imagine, the, like, the first film, the, the title is, like, um, a spoil from a Rolling Stone song, as tears go by, right? And this one actually is the one. It's, it's, it's very hard because I, I realized when I first become a director, they always ask you questions, what is your next film? <laughs> and you feel guilty when you have no, no ideas. Then you have to make up some names. So it's, <laughs> and I think, well, th this is a good title. So we make it like, uh, 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 I still remember this in Cannes. And, and they asked me, what is your next film? So this is being wild. It seems very good, right? <laughs> But sometimes we have the title before we have the story. Of <laughs> a different approach. Like <clears throat> Chungking Express, it, I think this is a, the original idea of this film is it is two parts. 
uh, one part is showing the day of Hong Kong and one part is showing the night of Hong Kong. I, I want to make a film about where I live and where I grew up and, and what is very close to me because Chim Sa Choi is very close to me. I know the streets by heart. Every day I just, we, we shoot at night because we, we have this Kowloon part at night. So I will, I will wake up at 12 o'clock in the morning uh, in the moon, noon, and then I will stay in, the, in one coffee shop at the Holiday Inn Hotel. And then I will write until 6 o'clock, and then I will walk to the set, and then we start shooting. So my, 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 my producer actually sit with me and to give all these orders what kind of props we are going to order. Because I said, well, I know this place so well, and, and I want to make a film just according to this map. And then um, Chris, at that point, moved to Hong Kong. He stayed in Central, which has all these like, elevators. Uh, and, and so we can uh, go to the mid-level of Hong Kong. So I think this is something very new. And so we create another part, the day in, in, in Hong Kong side. So that film actually is a Hong Kong that is my impression of the cities and which is close to me. We have, it's very difficult to find someone to produce our film. So we start our own company and we produce our own production. So we, most of the time we are working with a very tight budget like Chunky Express, basically we, we make this film just like the student films. Uh, we don't have time to set up like big setup. We just should just like, yeah. at that point we, we call ourselves CNN. We just do it like CNN, just bring the camera and shoot it <laughs> without permit, without any, any uh, 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 like uh, license. And, and we even get caught because we shot in the, in the subway without any license. And we, we have our, our, our just like warning from the airport because we just break in the airport and shot it. So every day is like planning a, a, a robbery. <laughs> and, and in fact, uh, um, some of our style actually came from there. It's like a lot of handhelds and we shoot with like uh, the step printing. In fact, step printing is not something like um, very difficult to understand because when you're shooting with existing light and you don't have a lot, a lot of light sources, you, the only way you, you have to shoot it with a, a fast speed of a, 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 a negative and then you have to like turn your, the, 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 the shutter speeds from 24 frames. Normally it's 24 frames per second. We just slow it down to 12 frames. That means it allows the exposure longer and so we can deal with these situations. But later on, we, we use it organically and, and it become our style. Uh, when we shot in, in Happy Together in, in, in Argentina, we shot one day in a, a place called Ushuaia, which is the, the, north, uh, the southest part of uh, America. And because after that, that will be like uh, uh, um, Antarctica, right? And, and because it's so far away from, from uh, uh, Buenos Aires. And we shot and shot until we realized with Chris, I said, do we have enough film stock? No, we ran out of film stock, but we still have one scenes. Then what we are supposed to do? Then we sit down and then Chris come up with an idea. So we go to all these photo, the, those shops to buy film rolls. It is like uh, film rolls, but the film rolls has normally, they have 36 frames or 24 frames. So we just wrote it and make this whole scenes in like a steel shots. So each shot lasts one second. And this is the way to do it. And, 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 and we have fun because I think at that point, we all feel this is an accomplishment. So sometimes people think, well, uh, yeah, you, um, this is your style, but I always want to explain to, to, to students especially, I said, well, it, it's not, not only an aesthetic uh, decision, sometimes it is a practical solution to solve your problem. And, and, it, and, uh, and one of the job of a director is you have to solve problems. But, but the thing is, is um, I, I, I believe to be a director, it's very important you have 
at least the skill or the craft to, to, to be able to write a script because at certain points, it gives you a freedom to, because uh, you won't be restricted because you know how to make certain changes because I don't think films can be made just like one by one according to the script. Otherwise, we just read, make a novel. Why don't we just uh, shoot a movie? I think that in the process, there will be a lot of sparks or there will be accidents or there will be situations. You have to make certain adjustments and, and to make it smooth. So I think that's, that's very helpful. And I always give advice to, to, to students and young filmmakers. Um, try to be involved in this process and try to learn the craft to write the script. But you've made big structural changes, like with Chunking Express, originally it was going to have more, like five stories, I believe. No, three. Three, OK. Um, and, but, and you drop one. And, and I guess in the um, days of being wild, I think. But I did. save it for uh, uh, Fallen oh, Angels. Fallen Angels, OK. I will never waste things. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, as I described to you, um, during shooting, we are just like a hungry man because we don't know if we can go back to this location or not. So we just shoot as much as we could. And during this, product, during this editing process, then we have all these materials lined up to us and then we select what actually is essential to these stories. Sometimes it's really about editing, it's also about rhythm because the film can be seen in this way or that way but you have to find which is the best rhythm for you and for the audience. Could you say a bit more, I mean, about specifically how you direct? A lot of times you really seem to be capturing very private internal feelings. And I don't know if you could just talk about the... No, I, th I think it basically uh, the reason you want to uh, work with this actress or, or you are attracted to this person is because there's certain uh, personalities and there's certain... Uh, qualities that attracts you. So uh, w the first thing that, that uh, uh, for an actress is it inspires uh, imaginations. The face can, well, you can imagine a story with this face and with this uh, look. So then you can create a character out of that. And, and I, I have no interest to, like, like to create an idea and then to ask someone to fit in this. I, 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 it is not my method. 